Okay, on behalf of Institute Lecture Series Committee, IIT Roorkee, I welcome all of you for this today's lecture by Dr. Swati Mohan. Uh, today's panelist uh, are Professor Ajit Kumar Chaturvedi, Director, IIT Roorkee. We have Professor Anil uh, Kumar Gaurishetti, Professor Deepak Oza, who is a uh, Institute Committee member. We have Professor uh, Partharan, who is Dean of Resource and Alumni Affairs, IIT Roorkee. So, to begin uh, with the program, first of all, I would like to request Professor Ajit Kumar Chaturvedi, Honorable Director, for his uh, kind welcome address. Sir, over to you. Yeah, I'm extremely delighted on this Saturday morning that uh, we have had the opportunity to hear Dr. Swati Mohan, uh, a name that we have frequently heard in the media, uh, a name that uh, Indians are proud of uh, because we can see her doing fantastic things uh, in the most advanced uh, engineering challenges facing mankind. Uh, while on one hand, all of us are deeply troubled by this pandemic, COVID, but I must also say that uh, I'm not sure if COVID was not there, we would have the opportunity to hear Swati because uh, physically visiting the campus uh, will not be that easy. Of course, we would be delighted to host her, but uh, that day we'll have to wait. So thanks to the situation currently, we are able to connect virtually to several people whom we want to meet, want to hear, want to learn from. And on this occasion, I would especially like to uh, convey, express my gratitude to Mr. P.S. Mohan, our alumnus of 1971 batch uh, Department of uh, Electrical Engineering. Uh, we had this uh, Golden Jubilee reunion of 1971 batch uh, last November, and he had a very nostalgic trip to the campus. Uh, we spent some good moments together. And uh, when I requested if I could uh, get a contact of Swati, he was very gracious. He immediately replied. And uh, thanks to our uh, Institute Lecture Series Committee, Dr. Shiram Yadav and, and Dr. Deepak Oja and everyone else that they followed up. And thanks to uh, Dr. Swati for having consented to spare a Friday night for us. So that's, I know that's, that's means a lot for us. We do uh, really convey our thanks to you and we look forward to listening to your very interesting lecture now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, may I request Professor Deepak Oza to formally uh, introduce this speaker? Deepak. Sir, uh, so Dr. Swati Mohan, she was born in Bangalore, India, and uh, she immigrated to the United States when she was one year old. Uh, she joined NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory first in 2004 uh, after completing her BS from Cornell University in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. After working as a system engineer on Cassini during Saturn orbit injection and Hygiene's probe release, she returned to graduate school to MIT. Dr. Mohan received her MS and PhD in aeronautics from the MIT system, uh, Space System Laboratory and then moved to NASA again. Since her return to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 2010, Dr. Mohan has worked on multiple missions such as GRAIL and OCO3. For the past eight years, she has been the lead guidance navigation and control system engineer for Mars uh, 2020 Perseverance rover, focusing on cruise and EDL. I don't know about these terms, so she will explain in the lecture. In 2020, she transitioned to the lead, the same team and mission commentator for the landing of the Perseverance rover on February 18, 2021. She is currently the supervisor of the guidance, navigation, and control system engineering group at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory and is also working on the Mars simple retrieval land. Dr. Mohan also co founded and manages the small satellite dynamics test bed. So, today's talk will detail the scientific roadmap of the previous Mars rover missions, evolution of landing technology, augmentations of the perseverance to include terrain relative navigation. She will also describe the fascinating journey of Perseverance 
from the launch to the landing. So with this and without further delay, may I request Dr. Swati Mohan to start a talk. Thank you. Very much. I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Okay. Share the audio. Yeah, it's visible now. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here and for all the students who have come to, to hear this talk. I know it's a little bit stressful for you coming into exams week. Hopefully this will be a, a little break for you and interesting and then you can get back to, to your studies. I'm going to tell you the story of Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, primarily from launch to landing, but a little bit of context from how the whole mission and the program came to be and ending with Perseverance's landing on Mars and all the things that we had to do to make that happen. So the story actually starts much earlier than just uh, a year or so ago. The, in the late 90s, actually, NASA formulated this strategy for how they wanted to explore Mars. Mars is our nearest neighbor, and of all the planets, it's actually the most like Earth in terms of form and function, actually similar to what Earth may have looked like in the past. So the early missions for Mars had a singular goal, and that was to follow the water. Here on Earth, where we find water, uh, we almost invariably find life. The existence of life is very much tied to where water is on this planet. So the idea was if we could find water on Mars, perhaps that would lead us to signs of life on Mars. So NASA started this multi-mission campaign to explore Mars with the eventual goal of trying to answer the questions of, are we alone in the universe? Is there life on other planets, especially on Mars? The first set of missions really followed the water. They were trying to find the evidence of water uh, and hopefully liquid water on Mars. They sent a series of missions, um, orbiters and landers and rovers, the most recent one before Perseverance, the Curiosity rover, which landed in 2012, actually completed that journey by finding the evidence that, yes, there was liquid water on Mars. With the advent of that discovery, the shift uh, became apparent to go from, now we've found the water on Mars, what does that mean for life? So it changed the next mission, which was Perseverance, the goal was no longer just to follow the water because we had proven with curiosity and the missions that came before that there was water and there were the building blocks of life on Mars. So now we were trying to actually explore the habitability of Mars. Can we go to a region on Mars that could have been habitable by life in the ancient past? And if we go there, can we find the signs that there were that there could have been life on Mars in the ancient past? So through this entire strategy, we've gone from sending these missions to follow the water. We found the water, and now Perseverance was actually trying to find the signs of past life on Mars. So Perseverance will was the fifth rover to land on Mars. The first rover, which you can see in this bottom uh, picture here, was Sojourner rover in 1997 that flew along with the Mars Pathfinder mission. So Sojourner, when it, when it went to Mars, was a technology demonstration. The entire point of it was to just see if we could drive on Mars, if the terrain and the functionality of the wheels interacting with the terrain would allow it to actually move in any reasonable amount of space and power uh, for that platform. With the success of Sojourner, we were able to send the Spirit and Opportunity rovers in 2004, uh, greatly increasing the size of Sojourner to a, more like a, a kid's uh, mini car, a big um, bicycle. When we got to Curiosity, uh, 
the science experiments and the instrumentation that we wanted to send was much bigger. So the increase from spirit and opportunity to curiosity was intense. And it actually caused a lot of challenges, especially for the entry, descent, and landing system. Curiosity is about the size of a, a car. And curiosity and perseverance are about the, the same size, roughly, and use very similar technology for the launch and landing um, on to Mars. So when we were going from spare and opportunity size to curiosity, uh, we actually found that we had to invent some new technology. So entry, descent, and landing is the process by which the landers or rovers get from uh, outer space, basically, to the surface of the planet through entry into the atmosphere, um, descent through, through all of the atmosphere, and then finally landing on the ground. The Spirit and Opportunity rovers uh, were actually relatively small compared to Curiosity. So the entry, descent, and landing system was a ballistic uh, entry. It relied very much on a parachute to slow it down uh, to terminal velocity. And then the landing system was what you could see here in this picture. Because the rovers were small enough, the landing system, the approach was to cover the entire rover in balloons, in airbags, basically. So they could be cut from the parachute while it's still there, and they would drop onto the surface, uh, but safely enclosed in these balloons and bounce and bounce and bounce safely until they released all of that kinetic energy, came to a stop on the surface of Mars, then we'd pop the balloons from inside the rover, they would deflate, and then the rover could go and drive off. Now, when we first developed Curiosity, they tried to use the same entry, descent, and landing system, but they quickly found that it would not work. Curiosity was a much heavier rover, uh, and the mechanism of covering it with these balloons didn't work. The weight of Curiosity and the type of surface on Mars with the, the distribution of small rocks and big rocks uh, was just a not a good combination. The, balloons would puncture and tear through this bouncing process and wouldn't provide the the safety that it needed to in order to ensure the safe landing of the curiosity rover so if you're curiosity they invented uh, an entirely new entry descent and landing system particularly the landing portion which was the sky crane maneuver perseverance inherited almost the entirety of that entry, descent, and landing system. But then it had to make even more upgrades to Curiosity um, because the landing site that Perseverance was given was much more hazardous than any of the previous rovers, Spirit, Sojourner Spirit, Opportunity, or Curiosity had ever been to before. So Perseverance was going to Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater, we believe, is an ancient lake on Mars, and you can kind of see this through these uh, this river channel that comes in um, through the edge of the, the crater here to form this delta uh, into this basin. This white ellipse here is the area that we were targeting to land Perseverance. And you can see that even in this white circle, there are a lot of hazards you see these big uh, hills here, this region here is a, a pretty big cliff face. Um, the reason why the scientists picked Jezero Crater is because the fact that we believe that this was an ancient lake bed gives us the habit habitability criteria, right? Where there was water on Mars, we think life could have formed. So the fact to go to Jezero Crater, especially in this region where we can sample from this region, which we think is the bottom of the lake bed, the sediments from the river delta flowing water through here. There's a lot of different uh, regions of geological features that differentiate um, just in this small region. One of Perseverance's big scientific goals is to return samples back to Earth. 
Perseverance is the first leg of Mara's sample return. And to do that, she needs to be able to pick samples from a diverse area that possibly have uh, signs of past life. So by going to Jezero Crater, uh, we have many different regions where we can go to collect different types of samples to maximize our possibility of finding life on Mars. Now that's great for, for a science perspective, but it's really challenging from an engineering perspective. Actually, Jezero Crater was considered for previous Mars missions, even Curiosity, but deemed too hazardous to, to land on. So in order to land here, Perseverance actually upgraded its entry, descent, and landing system in a couple of key ways to allow it uh, enough robustness to land at Jezero Crater successfully. But first, uh, just to give an overview of what a mission life cycle looks like for these type of Mars rovers, um, we start with launch that's getting off the surface of Earth. Uh, we have a cruise phase to get from Earth to Mars. Then comes EDL, which is entry, descent, and landing. This is a process from getting from space at the top of the atmosphere of Mars all the way down to the surface. And then the real mission begins. That's the surface mission. That's the part where all of the science actually takes place once the rover is safely on the surface of Mars. So here are a few pictures of the rover as it was being prepared for launch. And I show this to give you context of all of the different pieces that go in there. So when we think of the Perseverance rover, we usually just think of the rover itself, but the rover is only one part of the entire spacecraft that gets launched. So the rover is this portion right here. You can see the wheels um, kind of tucked up, up inside. That's this portion. That's the only thing that survives the entry, descent, and landing uh, process on Mars. Everything else at some point gets used up and jettisoned and fulfills its, its purpose. So starting from the, the top here, this cylindrical item, that's the crew stage. That's the piece of hardware with the sensors and the, the rockets and thrusters to get this whole spacecraft from Earth to Mars. Once it gets to Mars, we jettison the crew stage and then the spacecraft becomes an entry capsule. So it has um, the back shell, which is this white portion here, uh, and then the heat shield. Those two come stick on top of each other to form the entry capsule with the rover inside. The heat shield um, is what takes up all the energy through descent into the Martian atmosphere. Uh, and the back shell here is what holds the parachute. So the parachute is actually folded very intricately uh, into this back shell and it gets jettisoned using uh, basically a, a rocket engine or explosive out of this back shell here. Um, once we're coming down on the parachute, we get rid of the heat shield because we're slow enough that we don't need it anymore. Um, and then as we descend on the parachute, eventually we reach terminal velocity and the parachute can't slow us down anymore. So then we will jettison the back shell, which is this whole white portion here and come in um, the rest of the way on uh, the descent stage, which is this. It's basically a jet pack that uh, holds the rover underneath it, uh, sort of like a backpack. So it lights up these big rockets um, to fire, uh, to do a, a divert maneuver to get Perseverance right to the, the landing spot it wants to go to. And then when it's there, it uses those big rockets to actually hover above the ground and lower the rover um, on a series of bridles until it touches down safely. And then it cuts the bridles and the descent stage falls, flies away um, and crashes. So eventually throughout the entire uh, entry descent lane system, you're using up and getting rid of all these pieces until the only thing that's left is the rover itself. So to give you a scale of context, this is all of that hardware that I showed, all pieced together, about to be put in the launch vehicle fairing. So to give you a little bit of context, uh, this is a cabinet down all the way down here that's probably taller than um, the size of a person just about. And then this is the spacecraft, pretty small, in the launch vehicle fairing, which is so much bigger than 
uh, the spacecraft itself. So that top part of the launch vehicle fairing then gets put onto the launch vehicle itself, where the bottom part is mostly the explosives for launch itself. Um, so this fairing is at the very tippy top here of the entire uh, rocket, and the rest of it is all the, the engines that you can see here. We had a very successful launch on July 31st, 2020, um, and that kicked off the, the whole launch to landing process. So Perseverance had what we call a type one trajectory. This is a, a classic home and transfer, um, the shortest transit from Earth to Mars. So Earth at the time of launch was about here. Um, Mars at the time of arrival was here and then the Earth was about there. So we had about a one way light time of 11 minutes. So that means it took light or any communications 11 minutes to go from Earth to Mars and back the other way. So two way was 22 minutes. To get from Earth to Mars, uh, we did, we had the opportunity to do up to six uh, course correction maneuvers. Um, the first one was just two, two and a half weeks after launch. And then the second one was um, mid cruise. I think it was around November, October, November timeframe. And then the third one was in December. So for Perseverance, actually, we were able to uh, target accurately enough with just the first three maneuvers um, that we were on course. We actually didn't need uh, four, five, and six to correct. We actually targeted well enough with the first three that we, we really hit our target um, at Mars. So that was good. It was uh, about six, six and a half months from Earth to Mars, which is one of the shortest uh, transits we've had for actually out of all five of the, the rover missions that we've had. So it was a, a little bit challenging to get everything done during that time. But we eventually made it. Landing was February 20, February 18th, 2021. Um, and this is a description of what all needs to happen during entry, descent, and landing. We call it the seven minutes of terror because it takes um, seven minutes from entry interface that's the time when the capsule hits the top of the atmosphere all the way to the ground. I told you previously on the slide before that it takes 11 minutes for communication, just one way to go between Earth and Mars. So during the seven minutes, there's nothing that we on in mission control can do to help the rover. Everything needs to be programmed on board. Um, and there's a lot that happens because basically in the 17 minutes, uh, we are firing multiple explosives, changing the configuration of the vehicle from that entire spacecraft that you saw on the previous slide to just the rover in 17 minutes. So there's always something happening one after the other, and every piece has to go right to get to the ground safely. So uh, we mark time zero as entry interface. About 10 minutes prior to that is when the cruise stage comes off. Now, from Earth to Mars, the cruise stage is a balanced spacecraft. It's actually spinning at uh, two revolutions per minute. Once we separate the cruise stage, we actually de-spin the vehicle. So it's not spinning anymore. And then we eject some masses to actually create a center of mass offset. So the vehicle is not balanced anymore. It actually has an offset and it's become a lifting body. So during the hypersonic entry, we're at the top of the atmosphere, we're actually flying the capsule like an airplane. Because it has a lift vector, we can actually fly it through the atmosphere. And we do this to do guided entry in which we're actually controlling the path, the distance to the target during that hypersonic period. So we do a series of um, bank reversals, actually like S turns in the, high atmosphere in order to try to hit our target um, all the way downstream. So we uh, trigger the parachute um, about uh, you know four minutes later, three or four minutes later, um, the parachute is triggered at around Mach 2 um, and it provides significant deceleration from there down to subsonic speeds. Um, about five seconds or a few seconds after uh, the parachute is deployed, we jettison the heat shield because now we've completed the 
the hypersonic air maneuvering. We don't need the heat shield to protect it anymore. Once we actually jettison the heat shield, now we have sensors that can see the ground for the first time. So during this uh, period on the parachute, um, we're not really doing active control. So we are at the subject of the winds and, and where the parachute is taking us, but we are actually sensing where we are with respect to the ground. And this is one of the key updates that we did from curiosity to perseverance that I'll get into uh, a little bit later. So as we're flying down the parachute, parachute will eventually get down to terminal velocity, in which case it can't slow down uh, the spacecraft any farther than that. So once we get down to that velocity, now we've determined where we are with respect to the ground, we pick where we want to land. Um, we actually cut the parachute off because it can't help us anymore. And we fly down on that descent stage on that jetpack backpack to fly out from underneath the parachute and then go to the targeted landing site, hover over it, um, and then separate the rover by lowering it onto the series of bridles. Then the, the wheels get uh, separated, lock, locked into position, and then the rover touches down, wheels down. Once we um, have determined that the wheels are down, we cut the bridles and then the descent stage flies away so that it doesn't come and crash back onto the landing. So all of this happens uh, in 17 minutes from cruise stage separation all the way down to, to touchdown. So with this, actually, I wanna show you a video what actually happened on, on the day of landing. Hopefully the sound plays here. Propulsion, go. EDL phase lead, go. We have deemed Perseverance ready to execute entry, descent, and landing on her own. Confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second, about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. It will start controlling its path to the landing target. Parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. Chill has been separated. Perseverance now has radar lock on the ground. The back shell has separated. Sky team maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. Tango Delta, nominal. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. that video mostly because this video uh, has these key pieces that we've never seen in any previous Mars mission. So Perseverance was, was, was the one to get this shot of the parachute. This was the first time we'd ever had a picture of the parachute on any Mars landing actually inflated. We'd always had telemetry of ones and zeros that came back, but never an actual picture that showed how it worked. And the data from there that we could actually see um, the dynamics of the parachute deploy was incredible. That plus um, the final deployment of the sky crane ooh, maneuver here. Let's see if I can find it. Um, This is a picture of the actual rover taken from the descent stage actually as it lowered. 
Again, the first time we'd actually captured images during the entry, descent, and landing system that could be seen at this high resolution, which is just amazing. It's one thing to, to be able to see it in the ones and zeros of the data. It's another thing entirely to see it in an image, in a video, and see it working on another planet. Um, but back to the, the, so how did we do it? How did Perseverance land safely in a spot that every previous Mars mission that wanted to go to it couldn't? So we have two main pieces of technology that we use to enable Perseverance to land safely at Jezero Crater. The first one is a range trigger. So this refers to the logic that is used to deploy the parachute at the right time after the entry phase in order to, to deploy the chute. When you deploy the chute has implications on uh, where, uh, what your velocity is, how far down you're gonna travel uh, on the chute, um, be subject to winds and, and all of that. So previous Mars missions, the Curiosity used a velocity trigger, which meant that uh, the, the rover would wait until it sensed that it was at a particular velocity range uh, in a mock range, maybe around two or 2.1. Um, and just based on velocity without any knowledge of where it was with respect to the target, it would deploy the parachute just based on velocity. Perseverance took a little bit of a different route. Um, it decided to deploy the parachute, not, ba not just based on velocity, but based on the distance downrange to the target. So how far was Perseverance from the target at the time of, of parachute deploy? So based on uh, how far it was gonna be from its target, that's when it would deploy the chute. That one line change in the software to go from a velocity trigger for parachute to a downrange to the target trigger allowed us to shrink the ellipse from this blue area, which for curiosity, it, curiosity could have landed anywhere in this blue, uh, blue area to the yellow area. So you can see that it significantly reduces the footprint on Mars where the rover can land. Now, keep in mind that in order to prove that we can go to these landing sites, we have to prove that everywhere where it can land will be safe for the rover. So shrinking this ellipse of where uh, the rover could possibly land goes very, very uh, hand in hand with determining that the landing site is safe enough. So by shrinking it by over 40%, just by doing this one line change in code from the velocity trigger to the range trigger uh, was a big step in allowing Perseverance to go to Jezero Crater because it allowed us to get the smaller footprint and place that um, where it needed to be in Jezero Crater to maximize the probability of success in landing safely. Now, this alone wasn't enough because even this uh, ellipse size after implementing range trigger, um, this is the same size that I showed you on one of the earlier slides of the white circle with Jezero. Even in here, there's a lot of different hazards with the cliff face and the sand pits and, and things like that. So just doing this one change wouldn't have been enough to prove that we could land safely. We needed something else in addition to that. So the new technology that we added was called terrain relative navigation. So previous Mars missions, uh, like Curiosity, had relied primarily on a radar to sense a surface relative position. This is somewhat like uh, just closing your eyes and holding your hands out. You can tell how far above the surface you are and how fast you're going, but you can't tell where on the surface you are. So what terrain relative navigation allows us to do is that by including a camera for the first time and a computer with an FPGA that can process those images fast enough, we can take images as we're descending. We compare those images to a map that we have and actually can localize on the fly the position of the vehicle with respect to a map. So now you you just you know not just 
where you are above the surface, but you know where you are exactly with respect to the surface. So once you know where you are with respect to the surface, you can actually make a choice as to where to go. So we had another map on board, which was called our safe target map. So this is the this black circle is the same white circle that I showed you before on Jezero Crater, but now the background has been color coded to identify what are the safe spots versus the not safe spots. So red is, you know, danger, don't go there. Blue is the safest, and it kind of goes from red to green, red to green to yellow. Sorry, red to yellow to blue, green to blue where blue is the safest and red is the most dangerous. Um, and you can see Jezero Crater, there's a lot of red here. And it's not just, oh, all the red is on one side. No, all the red is kind of sprinkled throughout. So you really have to know exactly where you are and pick where you can get to. We only had enough fuel on board to go maybe about 650 meter away once we knew where we were. So it's not like we could come in and go anywhere in the lips. We didn't have enough fuel for that. So this white line is actually the trajectory of where we were coming in on landing day. And based on where we were right here, um, we picked uh, the safest spot that we could go to, which was in the middle of these red uh, hazards. But we safely got to there um, and were able to land safely. Um, so what enabled this was being able to figure out where we were on the fly. So uh, to do this, we developed a new sensor called the Lander Vision System. And what it was is a, a computer, a camera, and an initial measurement unit, and kind of put those all together. This slide shows the architecture of how the Lander Vision System works. So starting at around 4200, we initialize the lander vision system with its best guess of where it is at that time. Based on that, the lander vision system does a course matching mode where it takes three images, um, selects features in these images, which we have down uh, resolved to 12 meters per pixel, takes all the features uh, at once, and then does a batch update to get a course solution of where we were. This is at about a 200 meter accuracy in position of where it is. Based on that, it can initialize the fine matching mode, which then will take a single image and able to identify like 100 um, landmarks in that image uh, and be able to use those landmarks to localize um, the position of the vehicle. Uh, and once we get into the fine matching mode, now we can actually reduce that position error, um, which was originally about 3.2 kilometers uh, before we initialized LBS about 200 um, meters after batch update um, down to about 40 meters um, 99 percentile uh, after we do get into this uh, convergence of the fine matching mode. So in the course estimation mode, we kind of have two paths. We have the descent image. So this is what the camera is taking um, as it descends. And we take uh, roughly once a second. We identify landmarks in that uh, image, um, take those and then create uh, little cutouts, basically little regions around um, those landmarks, uh, and then normalize those areas. Uh, on board, we have a map already, so we crop the map to be um, around the region of interest. We normalize, and now we have these normalized templates to the map, and we do a correlation between those templates and the map. Um, by doing the correlation, we can get a peak, and then that gives us our uh, estimate of what the best fit is for each of those different templates. And by taking um, the three images, five landmarks per image, so about 15 of these matches, we can actually do them in a batch um, batch filter uh, and then use that to uh, to create an estimate of the initial horizontal position. So this kind of gives you an image of the green was the 3.2 kilometers of where we thought we were as we're coming in. Uh, the pink circle is after we do this course mode where we think we are. And then once we finish course mode, we actually kick off the find mode. The process is very similar. We take the descent image, we select features. Now these features, this um, 
roughly at six meter per pixel. So we get about a hundred of these features that we create the templates for. Um, and then we use that to correlate between the map image uh, and the, the templates uh, in the descent image. So if the purple, the pink from the previous slide was a coarse position estimation, now we resolved it down to the blue, which is a smaller position estimation after fine. So based on a requirement of um, 40 meters after in the fine match mode for LVS, we had um, designed the system so that it could land accurately to the selected safe target to within 60 meters, um, 60 meters three sigma. So on landing day itself, actually, um, we were able to land within five meters of the selected pixel selected targeted pixel, which was incredible. Um, the resolution of these uh, images are, is only six meters per pixel. So it basically means everything else went, went really well and we kind of landed to the, the best accuracy we could. It was a, a five-star day on Mars. This is the footage of the lander vision system um, for landing day on Mars. So uh, this top right corner is the descent image, the actual camera images that were taken. Um, the bottom here is the map that we used for landing. The blue square is um, the region where we've blown up here on the left. And then the red here is um, the image footprint the, that you see in the descent image that's actually um, mapped onto the map. Each of these squares is the templates that I was telling you before, the landmarks um, that we identified. So green or blue are good. That means we actually use them for processing. Um, red or pink or any of the other images uh, meant they were outlier and we actually rejected them before uh, taking them into the estimation process. So I play this. The first three images have the big templates and then it goes into the spine match mode. And you can see there were a lot of greens. Um, you can see the image that it'll get smaller and smaller as we do our descent. Um, it was only supposed to work until backshell separation, but it worked much, much lower than that actually. So you can actually see now um, the image is going to skew off to one side. This is the descent stage actually doing the divert after it's selected its safe target. So it's bunching up all into one area because the, the image footprint is going highly off meter. Now it's coming back. Uh, and then it'll skew to the other direction as it turns to stop itself. And you can see it zeroing in on the region that we actually landed on on February 18th. So that kind of shows the, the entry, descent, landing process from Perseverance, how it was updated uh, with range trigger and train relative navigation from Curiosity, and how Curiosity itself was updated uh, to use that sky crane maneuver from the previous uh, spirit and opportunity, which used the airbag maneuver. So it's a really complicated system and you know, no one agency or one center can uh, do it all by themselves. Uh, this is a picture of the team, actually probably around 2014 or 2015. And I put this in there just to show what an immense uh, team effort it is to build a mission like this. You know, there's people of all different backgrounds and, and technical abilities and uh, every single part is, is important. Every nut and bolt, every line of code, every test, um, all of those come together in a <laughs> single very critical event. Um, but all those pieces are, are necessary to actually get the, the job done. This is just a small sampling. We actually had like four different NASA centers um, five or six agencies uh, outside of the U.S. that contributed science uh, instruments and countries, and not to mention all of the different contractors that worked on it. So it was a really huge team effort. And then uh, this is the team on Mars, about taken maybe like an hour or two before we actually went into mission control to land the rover. Uh, we're, we're holding up our lucky peanuts that we usually eat before every critical event. Um, that we were only allowed to eat outside because of the pandemic. But that was our, our last good luck hurrah before we went into uh, the mission control for, for the actual landing. So with that, I will stop sharing and hopefully open up to questions.
Professor Deepak, did you want to moderate or should I start reading from the chat? Very interesting. That video was very interesting. Yeah, you can start, Deepak. Yeah. Shiram, you will take the questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so there are a couple of questions in chat box. So one question is from uh, Rajiv Das. What is the technology involved in balancing the turbulence of Mars atmosphere during EDL? Oh, that's a that's a very involved question. I have to admit it's not my area of expertise. I do know that the heat shield that we use, um, the material and the design of it, uh, is is geared towards absorbing a lot of that turbulence um, in the upper atmosphere. We do a lot of um, modeling of the atmosphere based on all the orbiter data and in previous. Mars missions to get as good of an understanding of what the density and pressure profiles and temperature profiles look uh, that high up, but it's still a little bit of a, an art. Um, and much of that is taken, uh, the brunt of that is taken by the, the heat shield itself during the hypersonic um, entry phase. Okay, so there is a second question from Pratap Singh. What population is or propulsions is used in between cruise approach in to EDL? So we use um, three different types of engines. Um, we have one set for uh, cruise. We have a different set for the um, hypersonic aero maneuvering, um, and then a third set actually that we use for the descent stage. Um, they are all mono propellants, um, have varying ISPs around uh, 150 to 180. Um, yeah, they're, they're various types of mono propellants that, that are used, um, designed for the types of maneuvers. So in cruise, we do uh more pulsed maneuvers um and then the like the main landing engines there those are throttleable engines that actually stay on for longer uh, and have a higher thrust to force ratio okay so there is one question at what frequency did the batch update happens in ideal and how much is it uh, into eventually as compared to the time of ideal yeah, so um, EDL is seven minutes. Uh, four of those minutes are actually spent up at the top in hypersonic aero maneuvering. Um, you have uh, like a minute and a half for most two minutes during the parachute phase, depending on uh, when it deploys. And the whole descent stage, uh, the whole divert and descent is, is less than a minute. So for terrain relative navigation, um, based on the 4.2 kilometer initialization altitude down to the two kilometer backshell separation altitude. That was its period of performance. Um, and it had during that time, um, at most like 30 to 40 seconds, uh, at, at the very least, like 15 seconds, depending on um, what model we used for the atmosphere. So we had to do the entire processing for LBS um, in 10 seconds or less. So that meant the batch filter, which is for the course phase, um, we took three images uh, that was roughly one, 1 1.1 seconds apart. So that in and of itself, you're at like 3.4, 3.5 seconds. And then the batch filtering um, of those three images took about a second to do on the FPGA. So um, it was roughly four and a half, almost five seconds to do those first images. Once we got into the fine mode um, and we were doing the extended common filter on a per image basis, uh, that whole process for per image um, was about a second to do from exposure capture through all the processing to update. Okay, so maybe the last one. What techniques used to course match while attached with the parachute? 
Um, so the the course matching, uh, we we take the descent image, we identify the templates, and then we crop around the template, um, warp it to the map, and then use a series of normalization techniques, and then a um, FFT correlation between the map and the the descent templates that we've um, warped and, and cropped to correlate the two. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, so is it still moving around the mass? Uh, yes. Maybe this yes. Is one question. It. Perseverance is, is roving a lot on Mars. It actually set the record um, just a couple of weeks ago for the longest single day drive of every any rover on Mars and the longest autonomous drive of any rover on Mars. So uh, Perseverance is is going around. It's gone to a couple of regions of interest. Um, it's finishing up one right now, I believe, and then its plan is to eventually go up that river uh, river channel to get up um, up past the delta, and it's kind of meandering that way as the scientists go and, and take their um, data. That's the that the eventual goal is to kind of get into that the northwest up the river channel um, area to see that part. Okay. I think Deepak, you have one question from YouTube. You wanted to ask. Yes, uh, we have a couple of questions from the YouTube. Ah, go ahead. Uh, the first question is asked by Ansita Behra. It's about what happens to the sky crane after its flyway. Is it used for any other purpose? Nope. It goes and crashes somewhere else on Mars. Actually, it, we have images from. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that show where it basically went and landed. It's not used for anything else uh, on Mars. Okay. Uh, there is another question that is uh, yeah, directly here. Previously, the Opportunity rover uh, got trapped in a dust devil. The solar panels got covered and the mission was shut down. So, in perseverance, is there any maneuver to avoid such problem? As perseverance will never have that problem. Uh, perseverance does not have solar panels. It's actually fueled by um, a thermal nuclear radioisotope generator, an RTG. So, it generates its own power and is not subject to um, solar, not subject to needing solar energy to. Uh, receive fuel. Now it does need solar energy for, you know, temperature and things like that, but it, it won't have the same problem that spirit and opportunity or or insight has in terms of dust getting on solar panels. So the RTG is actually what lets perseverance survive much longer than spirit and opportunity. Because the, the solar panels for them were only designed for like six to nine months, whereas perseverance um, is designed with the RTG to last one and a half Mars years, which is about three, um, three Earth years. I mean, Curiosity has the same design and it's still going and it's been 10 years this year since landing. Okay. So I'll take one last question that is by Rajiv Das. So is there any evidence of life received by perseverance till now? So we've, uh, we've collected about six samples um, of different types of rock materials. The, the identification of life, though, we cannot determine until those samples come back. I mean, that's a very large claim to make, and it's only when we can come back and, you know, have the full arsenal of scientific equipment on Earth that we could definitively say whether or not there's any evidence of, of life. But we have collected um, six samples so far, six, I believe, I have to double check that number, um, of different types of, of rock um, from the region of the basin, and we hope to collect collect more. All right, I think we have uh, addressed most of the questions that we have received here. Can I take one or two questions here? Hmm? Yeah, sure, 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 yeah. sir. So, uh, Dr. Mohan, how do you plan to bring the samples back to Earth? So that is a multi-agency cooperation that will need multiple missions over the next 
a decade or so to bring the samples back. So the, the next mission that I'm working on is called Sample Retrieval Lander. Uh, that lander will go on Mars and it will have a rocket on it called the Mars Ascent Vehicle. And that rocket will basically be tasked with getting the samples. Uh, once we need the samples to be put into, into that rocket, by some mechanism, either through a, a different rover that will be landed or by Perseverance. Uh, once those samples are in the Mars Ascent vehicle, they will be launched um, from the sample retrieval lander into Martian orbit, uh, into an, um, an OS, an orbiting sample canister. There'll need to be another mission, an orbiter, that can catch those samples in Martian orbit, collect them, uh, and then that orbiter will need to leave Martian orbit and then return to Earth, uh, put having put those samples into some sort of Earth reentry vehicle, and then launch the Earth reentry vehicle back to the surface Earth to get the samples back to Earth. So it's a it's a very complicated set of missions with multiple agencies working together to actually to get it to fruition. But uh, you know the planetary science community has been has been wanting to do more sample return for many, many decades. And with Perseverance actually now being on the ground collecting samples, at least we have that uh, first impetus, right? There are now samples for us to go get to bring back. So that in and of itself is exciting. Yeah, it's exciting from your talk to see how science questions are giving new opportunities to engineering and a new kind of engineering is giving rise to new science questions. Exactly. So this question of feeding science and engineering into each other, that's a wonderful thing to see in your talk and in this overall topic. I had a completely un, uh, unrelated question, unrelated to your talk. How can students of IIT Rutki get an opportunity to be some do some internship or something at NASA or any other exciting lab in US? Is there some contact through which we could get hold of that? Um, I don't think it's a single contact. Um, most of our, uh, most of that sort of collaboration comes through universities. So NASA, multiple centers, NASA work a lot with different universities. There's um, multiple programs, whether it's, you know, grants working directly with professors or postdoctorate opportunities. Um, those are the usual way to come through in terms of internships or postdoctoral opportunities. And they generally start the recruiting at the university. So um, that, that's usually the first step. You can come to a university in the US that has a tie and then usually through the professor or through the university itself, you can um, find collaborations with, with NASA. Are they open to collaborations outside US universities also? Um, well, no agency to agency collaborations like uh, JPL is working right now with um, ISRO on a, one mission called the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar. So I know there was uh, a lot of collaborations for there. Actually, the ISRO team was out at JPL for the past, I think, six months, almost a, a year or so, um, integrating the, the instrument here, the two parts of the instrument. And now the JPL team will come out to um, to India to help integrate the instrument into the, the final spacecraft. So there are always collaborations like that also happening, um, and also like on the instrument level too. So, thank you. Back to Deepak or Shiram. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you, sir. So now we are towards end of the program. So may I request Professor Parthara, our Dean of uh, Resource and MLI Affairs, IIT Roorkee, to deliver a vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Professor Chirav. So it's a, really a pleasure to uh, declare the vote of thanks for such an uh, extraordinary event that you are having today. So uh, first of all, I must convey my sincere thanks to Dr. Swati Mohan for uh, taking out time from our busy schedules that in the evening of Friday and talking uh, taking us to a journey of Mars. And we felt as if you are in the Mars, traveling to your Mars, and we are out of this world with your talk. So now beautiful explained and all. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohan. And we would expect in future to see you in the campus itself 
and physically see the things how is happening. I would like to sincere thanks Professor Chetribedi for making our time for giving an welcome address to this gathering. I must thank Professor Deepak Oja for conducting this such an uh, event in such a nice way and students volunteers for helping organizing this program and arranging the talk. Media Cell and ICC for broader advancement of this entire event. And of course, this event would remain incomplete if I don't and my thanks to Shiram for nicely coordinating the entire event, keeping in touch with all of us. And finally, the audience for making it success. Before I close, I just want to make one small announcement uh, on behalf of uh, 91, 1971 batch of alumni uh, to which uh, uh, Mr. P.S. Mohan, uh, father of uh, Dr. Swati, belongs to. And they have they are so glad to see the achievements of Dr. Swati. And they have decided to give a golden lion memento, which actually represents the symbolic representation of IIT Roorkee or University Roorkee, Dr. Swati Mohan, as a token of appreciation for her uh, achievements. And it will be sent to her through her mother. They have, they have given it to Mr. Mohan. And I think Mr. Mohan will be traveling to uh, US next week, as you just got told, and it will be there. So I am conveying this on behalf of the entire uh, 1971 batch and and thus I am conveying you this one. Thank you so much, uh, the entire batch. Uh, this uh, message has been given to me by Mr. Arvind Jain. So uh, thank you so much, the entire batch. So you'll get it next week. So with this note, I would like to close down. Thank you very much, all of you, uh, for coming to this uh, program and making a grand success. And thank you, Dr. Swati for your gracious presence in this occasion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swati. Thank you, Professor Thank you. Roy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Bye.